Okay, I hope the uh, recording is in progress. I can't tell actually. They said there would be a red dot on the screen which I don't see. But uh, unless somebody here knows what to do, I'm going to assume the recording is going on. Okay, I see nobody here knows what to do. Okay. All right, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hopefully, recording is going on. So I'm going to give be giving a tutorial on a couple morning. I don't know if the recording is working. You said there would be a red dot on the screen. I don't see it. Yeah, it's okay. good. Yeah, okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon again. So um, uh, my name is Balaji. I work at NOAA's Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, and I actually work at the Cooperative Institute. Uh, it's now called Teams Cooperative Institute for Modeling the Earth System, which is at Princeton University. Um, and today is the 11th of September, and I'm, I'm not an American, but I am a New Yorker, and so this is okay. Never forget. So this talk is going to be on couple modeling. Uh, it's a build of a tutorial, so I expect a lot of interaction. We can either do it with a lot of interaction, or we can do it where I just talk for a while, in which case it will be done well before 4.30, and we can go about looking at the rest of the So we can do it either way, but I hope you'll ask me a lot of questions. Um, so I'm going to give uh, an outline, an overview of uh, first of the scientific basis of, of building coupled Earth system models. So I'll, I'll give a brief introduction of what it is we're trying to do and why we why we go after couple modeling. What are all the things we're trying to do? And there's a lot of things you know. We know the atmosphere, oceans, clouds, ecosystems, photons being radiative transfer from, from you know, solar radiation is what drives the whole thing eventually. There's a lot of time and space scales involved, uh, so that makes the coupling problem rather hard because you have to think about uh, some problems which require uh, simulations over thousands of years, and then other problems which take place in seconds, and we have to model them all for certain classes of problems. And then you talk about dynamics in physics, like uh, we don't resolve everything that goes on, so if we just think in terms of physical and chemical resolution, we resolve some of it and not all of it. So we then have to separate those again into uh, various terms. And then based on the scientific basis of what we're trying to do, I talk about how uh, typical, not any one particular one, this is just, it's a generic talk, I'm not talking about uh, GFTL's particular Earth system model or entire or no more than any particular one. Just in theory, theoretically, what a coupled earth system model ought to be like is broken up into things which we call components, which are different subsystems of the climate, like the atmosphere could be a component, and the ocean could be a component, or we could subdivide it into finance components. We'll get into that. The issues we have to worry about, particularly for climate, are conservation and accuracy. If you, there are many quantities which will be exchanged between the various parts of the system. Uh, for example, we can think of CO2. Um, it has uh, sources and sinks on the land, in the ocean, and in the atmosphere. There's reservoirs, many reservoirs, and we have to transfer the quantities between all of these different components, but the total sum has to be always conserved. So how do we do deal with conservation and accuracy? Then we'll get into some of the algorithms uh, of uh, coupling. How you step time forward in a couple model and how you maintain why well, you have to worry about stability because in time stepping you can have a lot of things that give rise to instability. I'll talk about one particular feature that actually helps a lot with the issues of conservation and time stepping, which is called the exchange rate. I spent a fair bit of time describing how that works. Uh, this will be one particular implementation. This is one I've worked on for a long time. Um, the other problem is that now you have a big couple system, a lot of these things. Um, um, take a long time to run on computers, so we're always trying to increase the amount of parallelism in the system. So concurrency is a, a way of, of doing this, and we talk about how we can make um, 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 the physics in the system also run concurrently, like many things happen as long. If you look at nature, everything happens concurrently, so if you have let's say chemistry and uh, radiation going on at the same time, we don't have a situation where the ozone molecule says, uh, you know, there's a photon and an OH radical coming at the same time. It doesn't say, wait, let me deal with the chemistry first and then I'll deal with the radiation. In theory, everything has to happen simultaneously. But when you're working with uh, 
Kevin came by and said it was working. Okay, good. So I didn't see any of that. Yeah, that's what made me wonder. I guess his life is different. Okay. Uh, so we'll talk about how we can uh, do uh, course going concurrently, which is at the physical level, try to make processes run uh, concurrently with each other. So there are some limits to that. Uh, I'll talk about nesting, which is a particular kind of coupling, and then talk about how we do uh, nesting as well as a, as a problem where we, the, the concurrency will help with, the, with the, the speed of how fast we can run the model. There are many issues that take place at the i person boundary, which have to do with stability. There are some instability that occur occurs when you don't couple things properly. And in this particular thing, it has been explored to a great deal. So we'll talk about all these kinds of concurrency, and then you can get into it is, the system is very complex. Uh, so we can get into chemistry, coupling, dust coupling, various kinds of coupling. And if there are many areas I'm probably not covering, since I don't know all of you in the room, there are probably problems I'm not going to deal with, but we can get into it in the Q&A, or you can Stop me at any time. Think of it more as a classroom than as a lecture. So please stop me. Then we'll talk about, you know, how we can go in the future if you want to make it more and more fine-grade coupling, how we do it. There's a kind of there's a graph theory method to coupling, which we are starting to explore. We're not really going very far with it yet. And then I'll recap everything that we've done and give you a few links at the end. I'm sure these slides are available to all somewhere, so there are many links in there if people are interested in it. Uh, more more things can be found by Boolean as well. So let's start with the scientific basis. It may be familiar to all of you, uh, or it might not, so I'm just going to assume that um, please uh, bear with me if it's like really simple stuff for you. So this is just a, a kind of standard figure of what the atmospheric circulation on the Earth looks like. So you have these uh, trade winds, the northeasterly and southeasterly trades, so which move towards the west. If you notice, the uh, even though the arrow is pointing west, I call easterly. This is sailing down. It comes from the days of uh, windborne sailing. So the sailors name the winds from where it comes from, whereas we tend to say eastward or westward. So this is westward wind pushing the waters westward. What they call the easterly trades. And that leads to a convergence that leads to uh, air going upward, and then it has to sink somewhere, and that leads to the high pressure zone, which causes deserts in both the northern and south hemisphere. And then north of the tropics, and the tropics in north of that, you have westerly, and then you have a polar cell. So you have these two or three different cells, um, the Adley cell and the Ferrell cell. And then here, also along the equator in the meridional direction, you have a water cell, which is not shown here. So if you take uh, the sphere, you just, um, you know, the, the sun is uh, heating it, and it's spinning, and there's unequal heating, because the sun mostly tilted, but if you look, even ignoring the tilt, the, most of the heating is concentrated in the tropics, and the, most of the heat is being lost from the, from the pole. So somehow energy has to move from, uh, from the equator towards the pole in order to conserve energy. When you try to solve that on a spinning sphere with Korean sport as well, this is the circulation of the so this is what the atmospheric general circulation looks like. It's just basically a spinning sphere driven by unequal heating. And this is just a picture I picked up from one of NASA's websites. If you look at the same thing in the ocean, so the, here is another system. Again, there is a fluid. Again, it is trying to transport heat from equator to pole. But now it has to deal with all the continents. So when you look at these particular continents, and if you took a model and tried try to run it so in a paleo climate where the continents look different, you'll get a completely different circulation. But for this present day uh, distribution of the place, you get a circulation that looks like this. The red ones are shallow currents which are near the surface and they carry warm waters. And the blue ones are usually cold and deep waters. So if you look at the Atlantic, for example, uh, instead of having, as you had in the atmosphere, you had and stuff going out of the equator towards the pole. But because of this particular circulation, you have this, uh, some people call it a conveyor belt, but many oceanographers don't like that term. But nonetheless, in the Atlantic, you actually have warm water coming from the south, crossing the Atlantic, here it becomes the Gulf Stream, and then it moves towards Europe, it goes up there, and then it becomes cold and salty and sinks, and then there is a return flow. 
So if you if driven by the wind, it's driven by the spinning of the sphere and it's driven by heat transfer. So if you have wind and radiation and heat transfer, enough fluid and you give it this complex set of boundaries, this is the circulation you'll get. And kind of you can do if you with them with you can model this. I mean you can you can model this you can, you can run a model, give it the shape of the confidence and it will do this for you. And both of these things, both the atmosphere and the ocean circulation, what they're trying to do is redistribute heat that's coming in at the equator and leaving at the poles. So, and there is coupling between the two because the wind drives the ocean circulation and the distribution of temperatures in the ocean contributes to the heating of the atmosphere. So that's already you can see where the coupling is coming from between the ocean and the atmosphere. Oops, that one. Now it gets really interesting when you start thinking about how much more complicated you can get. Now you have ecosystems. So you have, let's think about the carbon cycle. So uh, it's kind of important because a lot of these models are used to study what happens if you keep adding CO2 to the atmosphere. So you have CO2 which is locked up in vegetation uh, in, the, in, the, in plants on the, in the terrestrial surface. You have marine ecosystems, phytoplankton and stuff like that, which also do photosynthesis. They capture um, uh, CO2 from the atmosphere and they, and they perform chemistry with it. And then uh, once uh, it gets in there and then the marine biota kind of pick it up, it goes through a whole ecosystem. A lot of it can sediment to the, to the bottom of the ocean. So that's one place where CO2 eventually can end up. If you keep adding and some of it is going to go into the ocean. So you, this is a map which is showing the storage. These are all little numbers here, which I'm not sure if you can read them from the back. But the basic point is that if you look at the deep ocean, for example, in, in gigatons of carbon, it has like around 40,000 since the reservoir. And compared to that, the atmosphere just has a small reservoir, which is around 750. The, the land has a few thousand. Fossil fuels are CO2 that has gone down in, in the past and been captured under the soil and now it's being released because they're still turning them into fuel. And if you look at the numbers of the fluxes, they're all in gigatons of carbon there in the units of one to five, somewhere in that range. So you're looking at something where the reservoirs are, many, are numbered in like uh, tens of thousands and the fluxes are, per year are very, very small. And you're trying to have to compute the balance of these very, the balance between two big reservoirs exchanging very small quantities. So you have to be quite precise in doing this. If you don't do it precisely, you're going to not get uh, something uh, that is actually useful for looking at this problem in the future. So there are many of these cycles between the vegetation and the atmosphere and the, between fossil fuels and the atmosphere and then uh, the ocean acting as a sink. And these are all very small amounts exchanged between these very large reservoirs. This again is a is a coupling problem, the amount of accuracy required in order to do these calculations. And then the clouds is another example. So far I've been showing just pictures from various websites, mostly from NASA. NASA has brilliant uh, pictures of you know they do wonderful work in like producing nice synthesis of a uh, lot of facts, you know, nice diagrams. Uh, this one is taken from a model, though. If you've been in other tutorials, you've probably heard about the SP3 model. Uh, this is just a picture from the model. Uh, nice thing is that the cloud field that it produces is actually like a real cloud field. So if you look at this, you look near the equator, you see something that's like little dark. So it's we call it popcorn. So tropical cloud field tends to look a bit like this. It's got a very small scale structure. If you go more towards the pole, you get these swirling swelling things like this. So this comes from these uh, waves that uh, go around and around the globe, and clouds tend to form into fronts along those, uh, along those waves, and that's what you see in these formations. So if you look at a satellite picture, it will actually look somewhat like this. You get these swirling large-scale structures in the middle latitude, and you get this very cluttered uh, cloud field in the, in the tropics. And the, the thing about this model is that it has variable resolution, so you can get down to very, very high resolution. So you can move it down, and so inside this area is showing that they're actually modeling a single supercell star. And inside the storm, you can see a few little funnel clouds that are making landfall. So you're getting structured in this model from this entire global field all the way down to the scale of a tornado in a single model. And uh, the real 
I mean, I'm not saying that this is the most accurate model. I mean, this is still, we've got a long way to go. But at least producing something where an image looks like a real star field. So, Tim Palmer, who's a, who's a colleague of mine at Oxford, he likes to talk about the climate Turing test. So, if you remember what a Turing test is, you interact with a computer by exchanging messages, and you try to tell whether you're talking to a computer or a human. And if you cannot tell the difference, then you pass the computer is passed the Turing test of artificial intelligence. In a similar way, the argument is that if you can produce a cloud field, which looks where you cannot tell whether it's a satellite picture or a simulation, then you pass the climate Turing test. We are getting to the stage now with our models where we can do that. We can get structure all the way from the funnel scale to the global scale. So um, this is the cloud. So this is another thing. And the clouds are uh, one of the most complicated things and the most hard, one of the hardest things to understand. And it's a property of the whole system because it's, the, the circulation is important because clouds come from convergence. But then there's condensation. There's a lot of small physics that happen where water condenses. And for water to condense, it needs a nucleus to condense on. So it needs uh, some chemistry. Aerosols have to be there present for, for the condensation to take place. And they interact very heavily with the radiation field. Shallow clouds um, can, uh, there are deep and shallow clouds. You know, there's some amount of heat reflection from from high, high clouds and from low clouds, there's a lot of heat trapping by clouds. So the, um, the, the amount of interaction that clouds have with the rest of the system is really immense and it's actually the biggest uncertainty in our models today. So this again is a highly coupled problem. So you have to get a lot of things right in order to be able to produce a cloud field. And then finally I mentioned photons. So this is the Earth radiation budget. So this is a famous picture. This is from the IPCC. I mean, I've basically chosen cartoons from um, various famous sources. And again, you can see there are many, many sources. The incoming solar radiation, some clouds will reflect heat. Uh, some, when the heat, some of the heat will reach the surface, and some clouds will actually be uh, will absorb heat. It will be trapped by the surface. Some will be reflected by the surface. When, when it, uh, when it. Uh, some of it will be captured in the form of latent heat. That is, it will the, the, the incoming heat will be transformed into latent heat in order to either evaporate fuel or to condense. So they they will go in both directions. And then there is uh, greenhouse gases which also trap heat. So there are all these processes that take place. And if you look at the numbers here, there's 342 coming down and there's 235 and 107 going out. So that adds up to zero basically. So if the Earth radiation were in if the Earth were in complete energetic balance, this would be a net zero. Right now, because we are doing, we are actually perturbing the system. It's slightly out of balance by like half to one watt per meter square, and that imbalance is causing a lot of trouble. So this, we have to solve that very accurately. This is one of the reasons why we do this coupled radiation, cloud, atmosphere, ocean modeling, is to try and capture this. And this radiative budget and try to simulate it very accurately. So these are all examples of why we are building these huge couple models. You have, if you don't get all of these things right, you cannot actually answer this question of what is the consequence of adding CO2 to the atmosphere. All of these things have to be answered for that. No problem. Any questions so far? Anything on this? Sure. It's not necessary to know that when the ocean current, uh, there's a water current in the one circuit current going to the south, it's going to be the south. I mean, there is, uh, the, I, I, I don't know how to answer exactly, I mean, that's, that's the question of why. I mean, like, for example, uh, why is the southern ocean connected all the way up north? It's just a result if you just follow the system. That's, that's the answer you get. So that's, that's the best answer I can give you. Um, if I can jump in there, what you're looking at in the North Pacific is simply the East End Gyre grid that is a map and you can turn it that is delivering some of that, that uh, water in the East Coast Ocean. It's come up in the Corotia, just where it's around and then head back to the Pattern, and it's going to be going higher. 
No, it's not the other imbalance. The balance system will give exactly the same situation. Yeah, so this cell is called the Hadley cell, and the dimension of the Hadley cell can be worked out from just knowing basic orbital quantities, depth of the atmosphere, and so forth. So if you have rising motion and then a stretch out, at some point it's going to start suspending. So the dimension of the Hadley cell is simple. Things that happen as a result of warming and the imbalance, uh, one of the things happening is that some results show, and I think it's fairly well corroborated, that the Hadley cell actually broadens as a result of warming. And because that, that has big consequences. That means desert cells tend to migrate towards the poles. And if you're living on the edge of the desert, that's a problem for you. Okay. Yeah. Now we talk about the scale of motion. And uh, there are lots of things uh, here also that we can think about. So the, the both large scales, this is time and this is space. So you're going from uh, seconds and minutes, hours, days, weeks, up to many years, hundreds of years at the top. And in this case, you're going from micro scales, which is uh, measured in meters. So you have from like meters or less all the way up to planetary scale. And at the very larger scale, you have these climate variations. And then there are what are called modes of variability of the system. Many of them are coupled. They are consequence of both ocean and atmosphere. So an example given here is ENSO, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which has a time scale is an oscillation of specific temperatures on the scale of a few years. There are actually longer modes of variability not marked on this picture. There's a decade of oscillation, there's a specific decade of oscillation, or Atlantic multi decade of oscillation. So there are many modes of variability all the way up to the climate scale, which is Climate variations is changes to forcing. And then coming down in time scale, you have the seasonal cycle, which can be purely understood from orbital mechanics. Uh, I'm going to earth and around the sun. Inside interseasonal, you have the magnitude in oscillation, which is again something in the Pacific. It's a somewhat well understood. Some models are starting to model it very well as you get to higher resolution. Then you have planetary waves, and then going down in scale, you get to what are called synoptic scale weather systems, where you have tropical cyclones. In the middle latitude, you have uh, fronts, which is cold and warm fronts going in. Cloud clusters are also at this scale. So you can see that the spatial scale is not dropping to the order of hundreds of kilometers from being planetary scale. And then once you go below that, you get into what are called mellow scale, where you have thunderstorms and tornadoes, which I showed, them, I showed an example of in the simulation. And going even further down, you have thermals, and then finally you have turbulence, and turbulence takes you through all the way down to the micro scale. So there is a scale called the Kolmogorov length scale, which if you get all the way down to it, that's where the turbulence gets stayed in. So you have motions on all of these scales. Some of them are coupled, some of them can be modeled during the atmosphere. But for the couple system, you have to get them all. You can show a similar picture for the ocean. Again, you have climate change and you have basement scale variability and so over here. And then you have, uh, you know, they have eddies, which are kind of long lasting circulations that form in certain spaces. And then you have measure scale, which, uh, you know, there are, uh, there are shorter scales, there are places where there's physical and biological interaction. And then you can again go down to inertial motions, you can go down to uh, gravity waves. And the, like the tsunami and stuff like the surface waves that have moved very far. And then you have turbulence in the ocean as well. And all the way down to molecular velocities. So you again have the same cascade of scale. And now you imagine that you're actually trying to couple these two. So you have stuff at this scale which can affect the larger scales and you have larger scales that are affecting the smaller scales. So all of this has to be dealt with in the problem. So this is a, a again, so it's, it's, there are many, many versions of this figure. I just picked up one from the internet. I think this table got changed in the first one that shows this particular figure. Yeah. Yes, yes, you would. 
So you, you, you can talk about actual ecosystem interaction happening at very small scales, and then large scale as well. And I actually did find a picture like this for the land surface as well. I didn't show it though. You can find it. So to model all these things, we have uh, what I call here the model view. Uh, some things are when I say models, they're actual simulations. They're actually you you write down some equations or you write down some terms. They can they don't have to be equations. They can be statistics. You write down something on the computer and actually turn the track on the computer and get the result. Some of them are purely conceptual models. And some are highly theoretical. Some are very very concrete. Like they're actually trying to put all the processes in. So in the very very conceptual models, you have um, you know you have things like the ideal gas law, which is you known. TV equals RT, which is well known. You have Navier-Stokes equations, which is basically Newton's laws written first here. And then for so at very fine scale, I mean, if you increase the Reynolds number of turbulent flow beyond a certain point, you cannot actually solve it directly. So you have Reynolds average flow. So you, you're again moving in scale. So you have in the complexity of the system is the x-axis. So you have the Earth system, which is the entire planet, and then you have just the atmosphere uh, land system, which is, uh, and then you have just the atmosphere, as I said. If you, below a certain scale, in time scale in particular, you can treat uh, oceans and stuff as being, because they're kind of slow moving fluid relative to the atmosphere. And the atmosphere, can, you can think of it as a fluid system, and obviously, uh, a fluid system is just not going to remember kinetic theory of gases from, from graduate school. You can get fluids out of just particles, <laughs> putting a large number of particles together. And you can make very simple models, or you can, have, you can make very complex models. So you have, along this curve, gas kinetics is actually putting a lot of molecules and letting them all bounce off against each other and then computing the gas rates. You have what is called direct numerical simulation, which is a model where you are not making any uh, turbulence closure. You're actually trying to solve turbulence. The only thing you're putting in is molecular scale viscosity. Going up above that, you have what are called larger simulations, which are modeling turbulence, but they're actually putting in a turbulence closure for very small scale motion. Then you get the cloud revolving models, where the clouds are, the, the 3D motion is giving rise to clouds are are uh, 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 actually simulated. And then you can go to atmospheric uh, GCMs, you can go to atmospheric ocean GCMs, earth system models. So you're, you're increasing the complexity, you're bringing in more and more systems into the picture. You can go still further if you like and actually say you have what are called integrated assessment models. So you're actually treating the humans also as something that you can simulate. That is, you say that in response to a certain policy change, this is how the earth system will evolve. And this is how humans will react to that. And you actually try to simulate that as well. I mean, you can take it seriously or not, but I'm saying that a class of models exist. So you have this whole slew of different kinds of models. Many of them involve coupling between different subsystems that come from very different fields. And this overall thing is the problem we are trying to solve in some models. And the couple systems can be what I call brittle. Many systems don't work well with each other. We are mostly over here in the blue part, climate models. We have atmospheric process, we have oceans, we have terrestrial to the ice. You can start including the terrestrial carbon cycle, which brings in agriculture and forestry. So the land use change has to be taken into account in the transit called terrestrial carbon cycle. We have marine ecosystems. And then you can start into the IA and the integrated system model that's trying to bring in the economy and, and energy and all that. So how policy changes take place in response to uh, global warming and, and what would be the connection between the two. And then you can go further and start talking about impacts, which is what will happen to health sectors or how will, what will happen to, you know, the, you know, cities have to migrate because of sea level rise. Do you wonder if you actually can you actually model something like that? So the thing is, each one has a group of specialists working in it. Some of them are even all the way over here: social scientists, physical scientists. They're all trying to talk to each other. Some of them are using data. Some of them are not. We have to figure out how to work together. They all use different kinds of software. 
So there's four kinds of the social, scientific, semantic, and software challenges. You know, the fact is, you know, first of all, when you get these groups together, just getting them to understand what each other is saying is a hard problem. And then after that, there's actually, can you actually couple these things together in a way that makes sense? How would you know? How would you test such a model? And then there's a semantic challenge because the language is not the same. So when somebody says temperature, they mean one thing. Some other group means something else. Some people think temperature is a daily in or max. Some people think it's the instantaneous, that sort of thing. And then of course, there's a lot of software systems that have to work together. So this whole system is quite brittle. So I'm going to focus for most of my talk on this part because that's what I do. Okay. Sure. Or what is the difference between a couple and selection atmosphere ice model and a grid system? The commonly when you start including ecosystem, meditation, and try to simulate that, we call that an ecosystem. So if you have an interactive interactive system. Okay. Then the final point I want to get to before we get into what other software systems are built is that um, there's no actual separation between small scales and large scales in a physical sense. So this is a very famous 30-year-old paper which, which is measuring the spectrum of kinetic energy in the atmosphere. If you look at the very large scale, the fluid flow around the atmosphere, you can think of it as a 2D fluid. If you look, you know, if you go far enough away, you can think of it, forget about the depth. The, the large, very larger scale flow, you can think of it as a 2D fluid. 2D geophysical turbulence, 2D fluid turbulence on a sphere, if you, you can follow the equation and it tells you that it will come up with this, uh, the, the slope, that it will come up with kinetic energy on a power law which has a minus 3 slope. Then at some point, as we go to finer and finer scale, the x-axis is again the scale, the wavelength of motion in the atmosphere in kilometers. So as you go to a uh, wavelength of hundreds of kilometers, tens of kilometers, you're coming down. I mean, this axis, the wavelength is decreasing now. As you go to finer and finer scale, at some point, the flow looks more 3D than it does 2D. Now, for 3D turbulence, the slope is minus 5 thirds. And the point is that this is the 3 d turbulent minus factors continues all the way down to one kilometer and even below, all the way down to molecular scale, basically. So between a hundred kilometer or a thousand kilometer, or let's say a hundred kilometer model and a one kilometer model, the physics doesn't change at all. It looks exactly the same. Now we cannot solve everything at this high resolution. We cannot today build a one kilometer global model and run it at a useful speed for doing climate science or even weather. So we arbitrarily have to truncate this somewhere. And see, we are going to treat the finer scales which we are not resolving in our model by using some different themes usually called closure. And in, in our language, we call the resolved scale dynamics and everything that's unresolved is called physics. So now we are going to write two different pieces of two different models basically, one to solve the dynamical equation, one to do the closure or the physics. And the physics can be very complicated because if it includes cloud, if it includes moisture, sometimes moisture will condense. So that process is very complicated. When it condenses, it gives off heat. And it forms ice crystals as well because the clouds are one of the most complicated parts of the system. So because of that, the physics is very complicated and then the dynamics. So there's two different systems. And again, you have to figure out how to couple these two things together. So these are all the things we're going to deal with in terms of couple modeling. Yeah. 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 The, the thing that's somewhat simpler about the ocean is that it doesn't have uh, moist, the equivalent of moisture. Yeah. So there's no equivalent of sun. So I want to introduce some terms now. So when you talk about coupling, because we talked about various different kinds of coupling, and I want to make sure we distinguish all of these. So when I say coupling from now on, I'm going to talk about different subsystems of the climate system, 
which are totally different atmosphere and ocean, for example, which are physically different. But they communicate with each other, they exchange quantities, uh, heat, momentum, um, energy, uh, even trace in a carbon, they exchange with each other, and they are fluxes in both directions. So that I'm calling coupling. To talk about nesting, nesting is a form of coupling where there's a component of final resolution which is coupling to itself a coarse resolution. So you cannot increase resolution everywhere because you cannot afford it. Let's say your phenomenon is interesting only in a small area, like you want to follow a tropical storm. You can put a nested area of high resolution just over the storm. So nesting means a coupling to a component to the same physics but at finer resolution. And there's two kinds of nesting. One way nesting means that the course, the, the large scale field affects the small scale field, but there's no reverse feedback. That's called one way nesting, and sometimes it's called dynamical downscaling. And if you do, sometimes we need to get RCMs, regional climate models, or limited area models. They're usually driven by boundary conditions and large scale conditions driven from the global model. So that's one way nesting. In two way nesting, there is a feedback. So the fine scale has to be integrated, and then whatever happens to the fine scale, you average it and send it back to the core scale. So that's one way and two way nesting. There's a term which and I attended a few talks today, and they call everything a lot of this coupling. One thing I'm going to call training here, which is something that's a model of a different part system which doesn't feedback. So for example, if you have an agriculture model, it may want temperature and the humidity and the soil moisture information from your global model. But if you don't, you're not worried about whether the changes in the agricultural patterns are themselves going to affect the climate, you just chain it. And chaining is a different, for very technical, for just, you feel it for technical reasons, it's a very different problem because you can chain by just sharing data. I just try to run my model, create a data set and then send it to you and you can run your model. But if coupling means you actually have to somehow make them talk to each other while the while the simulations are running. And then finally I made this distinction between dynamics and physics. As far as I know, ours is the only field which when you talk to physics, they'll say now you're talking physics, what do you mean? So, yeah. so but we make this distinction, we say resolve scales are dynamics and unresolved scales are physics. What is the conversation Yeah, it's all in physics. Different physics, you can have different physical components. And so you can so you can talk about this. And I'll show three of components in a bit, and you'll see that they, 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 you can recursively keep making more and more components. Yes? Just a little different way. Do you use also another way of reducing the distribution all the time? Yeah, that's what you're talking about. Variable resolution. That's not nesting. Yeah. But a uh, very good resolution, I would, I would not call it nesting. It's just very good resolution. Okay. So, okay. so there is something. Yeah. 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 Ye
And notionally, an earth system model has an architecture that looks like this. This is just notional. I mean, no, no model doesn't have to be constructed this way. So you have something called an earth system model that's going to have an atmosphere, land, ice, and ocean. The atmosphere, as we said, is going to be split into dynamics and physics. Inside the physics, you have all the parameters relations, as we said. There's radiative transfer, there is all the moisture, which is calling H2O, there's a planetary boundary layer. All of these are different components of physics. So land can be also uh, have a separate vegetation model and a hydrology model, which I'm calling land H2O. Ocean can have its own biology model, and it can have a color model, which which is uh, depending on how murky the water is and how much it gets absorbed and all that. It interacts with the radiation in a very specialized way, depending on what's in the water. So that has its own model, and you can imagine that each of these has a its own scientific community, its own journals, its own conferences. No, so each of these is a big community in its own right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, lambda should be there. Too. It's it will be its own component. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just not one. Yeah. Yeah. Lambda and ice sheets are very separate. Uh, they, they have, as I said, they have their own conferences on journals and people. <laughs> it's its own community. It's, 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 it's a very big field at this one time. Right. I mean, I guess like, really, I don't see the current you know, Are there? Yeah, we're starting to have them. We're starting to have them. So people, if you're studying the sea level rise problem, you start to include ice sheets and land ice, and uh, they're, they're <laughs> quite linked. It is, um, for the glaciers to make their way into the ocean, there's, there's a sheet there right. so long. So that, that, that model in Cobalt as well. There's actually a big, there's a big push to have more of those in, in the latest, um, latest cell system model. And I think it'll only become more important this time. So, as I said, each one has its own community, and they have their own algorithms, they have their own science. So they must be able to choose whatever they want to do. They cannot, the atmosphere cannot tell the ocean guy, you have to code your model in this way. And so they have, they have their own algorithm, they have their own way of discretizing their system. They have their own way of doing time stepping. It depends on their algorithms. So in couple modeling, you must think of this. You are going to couple to somebody who, and you don't know much about what's going on inside their model, because they have their own uh, practices. So, uh, yeah. And the, 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 the doesn't have a direction of, well, there's, there's two things. One is uh, in response to climate change, you can have migration, like trees can move, move. It is, but it's not a direction. It's just that the next generation of trees will move into the warm zone and leave the cold one, so or it will leave the hot zone and move into the warm zone, whatever it is. So there's no migration. It's not advection. But there is some amount of in the in the hydrology, some nutrients can enter the rivers and then it gets transported by the rivers. So there is transport and migration, but I would not call it advection. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, we are modeling the dynamic vegetation ecosystem dynamics and vegetation dynamics are modeled. In an earth system model they are all similar. And they're very, they're very, very complex models also. I think I have one example later. Um, as I said, the previous architecture I showed is just notional. This is what the various components are. This is just a poster I understand. I don't want you to grab the details. But these are all different climate models from around the world. And each of these colors and ovals represents one is an atmosphere, one is the, the orangish ones are land and so forth. And you can see they're all different. Some of them have the land inside the atmosphere, some of them have them outside, some of them have ice inside the ocean, some of them have it outside. So there are all kinds of different ways you can do this in software. Even though your conceptual notion of a couple model might be the same. And the other problem in our field, well, I don't know if it's a problem, it's actually a good thing, but it's kind of a problem. So there is one component which is a dynamical form, which we call dicor. And in a dicor, uh, the, the there's only a few key variables, mass and momentum and so forth, energy. 
Uh, there's a lot of uh, abjection and things like that. So there's a lot of strong coupling in the horizontal and vertical between the two components. And so there's many numerical methods for doing these things. There's finite distance, finite volume, finite element, lots of spectral which I forgot to put on this graph. But all of these methods are actually being used by somebody or the other. So there's, there's no uniformity in, in the way we're de dealing with these things. You go to different climate models around the world, they use different methods. Land is, because there is no adjection problem, there is not, usually there is no data dependency. But inside a land cell, the vegetation can be very complex. We can have many, many different types of vegetation. And uh, so, and then you can, some models, they even have cohorts. That is, with trees, they, they have trees of different ages, which are competing for sunlight and things like that. So they, they model all of these things. And then, when you have a spherical grid, if you have an actual pole, like if you imagine a lateral on grid, Poles have singularities have many numerical issues, so mostly people try to avoid them. One set of the fewest often in the ocean is to have what's called a tripolar grid where the poles actually go on land. So then in the ocean, in the Arctic Ocean, there's no pole. Southern Hemisphere, there's land, and in the Antarctic, at least. So the present day continent, there's no problem in the Southern Hemisphere. Another approach is used for what's called the impasse model, uh, which uses the unstructured grid. So here, as uh, Jean-François mentioned, you can make this variable resolution. You can add resolution wherever you want. So you can make this completely a non uniform grid. So there are many kinds of grids in use. And if you're going to couple between these grids, you have to figure out how to transfer data between these two completely different grids in a way that respects all your laws. You have to satisfy conservation and so forth. And one other problem which I think is of relevance, which again deals with couple systems, is uh, uh, data assimilation. So the way data assimilation is done is that um, you you have a model and you run it forward, and then data comes in and the model doesn't quite agree with the data. So you have to find some trajectory. If you have multiple data points, you have to find the trajectory of the model that, in a least square sense, best fits all the data that you have. So normally how we do that is we run an ensemble of models. We run many, many copies of the models with very, very small changes to the initial conditions. And you get what's called the, the higher uh, probability distribution function of some variables. It says, if I don't know anything, if I don't have any data, I just have initial conditions, you get this distribution. Then the observations come in. And the observations are, um, they also have an error. They're not exact. So they also have uh, some kind of Gaussian error shape. And if you say that, try to make your prior satisfy these observations, you try and you'll get something which is slightly narrow. It still has this shape like this, but it's narrowed by the observation. So the way we do this in a couple system is that we actually have a, a ensemble, what's called this ensemble system. So you have many copies of the ocean model that are running simultaneously. And then when you want to assimilate the observations, you take the statistical distribution of results across all your copies, each instance of the ocean model, and then put it into this state. And then you try to uh, match this state in a least square sense with the observations that you have. So this is called the Kalman filter or ensemble Kalman filter approach. And you can see that this also involves a lot of, uh, for example, if you each of the, you have know, three members of the ensemble, and each one is running on a thousand clusters. You're going to move it all over. You're going to have 3,000 clusters now to play with for doing the observation. So you have yeah, the couple of system is doing all of this work. So, so you, yeah. When you do that, though, is the coupling happening when you do that? Like, is this a, a secondary, not a process of doing that, but what process being or a separate? Like, you don't have when you have nine couples of all of going. Yeah, we actually do have nine going. Okay, couple. so you're doing a couple of these ones. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to start talking about the nitty-gritty of doing some of the stuff. So the, we talked about all the issues of how we're trying to build this. Now I'm going to talk about how we do actual coupling. Uh, so initially, let's assume that we just have two components, atmosphere and ocean. And uh, they both, everything is a parallel model now. So you have to start talking about parallel. And I haven't talked very much about it, but everything is being parallelized in a, in a, in a scalable system. And let's say this is the x axis is the number of crosses you parallelize it on. So if you use what's called a forward backward time step, so the atmosphere at time t plus one, 
depends on the previous state, and then it depends on the ocean state also at the previous time step. So, as I said, a T plus 1 is stating its boundary conditions from the ocean at time t. And the ocean goes forward backwards because, see, the ocean T plus 1 is actually taking the state from atmosphere T plus 1. So, ocean T plus 1 is the previous state of the ocean plus some function of the boundary conditions. So this is called in in numerical lingo is called a forward backward time step. It's stable it integrates well. But let's say your models don't scale the same way. The ocean scales up nicely up to some number of processes, but the ocean and atmosphere stop scaling. Then during this time you have idle time. So you don't want that. So you want to split it in somehow. So what you do is you try to make these components run concurrently. The problem now is that the atmosphere can, can does not know this, this state. It only knows the state of the previous time step. So atmosphere T plus 1 is still taking its boundary condition from the ocean at time T. But the ocean at T plus 1 now takes the boundary condition from the atmosphere at time T. It cannot take the T plus 1. So now this becomes a forward, what's called an Euler forward time step. The problem with the Euler forward time step is that it can be proved to be unstable. So if you integrate this long enough, you're going to the, you're going to get like massive oscillation. The reason it works, we do this a lot in practice. The reason it works is that the system is actually strongly damped. That is, the radiative cooling that's coming from the atmosphere actually keeps the, can, cannot let the atmosphere stray very far from its initial state. So because you're working with a damp system, you can work with a numerical scheme which is in theory unstable. And it still works in practice. But this is something we do, and quite often we get unexplained behaviors and all that because of the instability, and we'll get to that. And that's why I put an asterisk on the damp system. Yeah. So the reason why they did it that way is because the ocean is much slower than the system, right? Because you could have done it the other way, right? You could have done yeah. it the other way. So it's probably more sensitive because the ocean is slower. Yeah, but it depends which one. The ocean and atmosphere, you can interchange them. It doesn't matter which one is which. Just so that one scale is better than the other. You never get two components that have that the scaling behavior out to the same one. One will all, there will always be one that scales better than the other. So it's going to be all. And then the, point, the other problem, so this is the time stepping problem, time stepping and stability, and I'll show uh, some more examples in a bit. Um, the other problem is that um, you have diffusion processes that are going through the surface. Uh, so the the problem is that the atmosphere is a big reservoir of heat. The ocean in particular is a very big reservoir of heat. But you have these surface layers which have very small heat capacity. So if you have if the weather is changing, if there is a sudden change in temperature because the front went through the ground will try to react to it quite instantaneously. You will try to react to it very quickly because its heat capacity is very small. <coughs> so because of that, uh, when you're solving this diffusion equation, which has this form, so you're solving T k at n plus 1 uh, in with, uh, respect to the temperature at a particular k is the vertical level. Normally, when you have uh, these very fast things, you solve with intensity. That means you're using temperatures at the time n plus 1 on the right hand side. And the way you solve this is you can rewrite it so all the n plus 1s go over on the left hand side, and you get a matrix term like this. And because of the k plus 1, k minus 1, and k term, the form of the matrix A will be a tridiagonal. So there's a tridiagonal matrix you have to solve. Tridiagonal matrices, uh, the solution is very well known, known from the time of Gauss. So there is a, you can do it by elimination, so you do it by one pass downwards from the top to the bottom of the matrix, and then one pass back upwards. The problem is now the temperature now is going to cross two components. It is going to be a, some of the temperature, this is just solving diffusion across, let's say, atmosphere and land, and ice and ocean, but let's just say atmosphere and land. You have to solve it in two components. So the way we do that, so this is my picture of a tridiagonal matrix. So the red lines are there. Everything that's not a red line is, uh, has zeros in it. Some of these layers are in the atmosphere and some of them are in the land. 
in order to do it exactly correctly, complete conservation, you put in this thing in the middle called the exchange grid. And if you look at the exchange grid, each cell on the exchange grid is, is basically, if you overlay these two grids together, you get what you get. So let's say you have two cells in the atmosphere, you have three cells in the land. The exchange grid has one cell that belongs to each, and this cell belongs to here and here. So you can see that all of the boundaries here correspond to all of the boundaries that are in the two cells on either side. So this middle thing is the exchange grid. Now the interesting thing about the exchange grid is that if I want to say what's the quantity here, I can always sum two quantities from here and tell you the answer. Similarly, some of these two will give you that. So the exchange grid will always give you a conservative representation of any quantity which is in either way, because it's the union of the two. No, this isn't the horizontal. Yeah, this is the horizontal. Yeah, because you have to solve this for each each column. And the columns of the two grids don't overlay exactly with each other. Because they might have different directions. So here's what we do. So this is what it looks like. Again, I'm just showing you the one thing. So here's an atmosphere with six cells. And then underneath it, you have three cells of land and six cells of uh, the, uh, the ice model. We call it the ice model, which is the ocean. We think of it as the ocean surface model. It's the skin over the ocean. It has six cells. And you can see how the cells are broken up. So you look at the interaction of these two. So these two cells add up to that one. These two cells add up to that one. So the, the exchange grid has been written. And it has a component there called the surface model. This is where you compute the fluxes within the component. And the exchange grid by construction guarantees exact conservation of everything. It is not universally used, um, but we, we we have been using it for a long time, and we are now uh, pushing it into the standard layer that is being built for universal models. Right so the same technology is going to appear in ESM and that. Maps are used to this, so Max Florida is used to it. So this is just, uh, I'm going to skip this one slide. So now let's think about tidalism. Now this becomes an even more complicated problem. Now the atmosphere has been tidalized onto two cells. And let's say the ice here has been tidalized onto one, two, three, and the land is sitting on one cell. And the ocean has been split into two cells. And so, two domains, yes, sorry. And the part of the future and the end. Yeah. Um, so, the exchange grid is something we can create from the knowledge of what you're actually doing. And the land. The land. Yeah. If you know all your grids, you can create the exchange grid. Yeah. It's not exactly. We'll get to that in one more slide. Okay? Because there is an issue because the land sea boundary is discretized, can be discretized just in two different ways. Okay. I'll get to that in a second. But let's just think of the parallelism issue first. Uh, uh, I think I have enough time, but if I'm going into too much detail, uh, let's see. It looks like I'm halfway through my part. Um, so you. You can, it's because now the, the exchange grid now has is uh, what we've decided to do is to say that the exchange grid will always be parallelized based on one side or the other side. Uh, if, if, if the decomposition is different between two layers, then you have to communicate data between processes in order to make this happen. So here, if you see between this layer and this layer, the parallelization is exactly the same. So there's no communication involved. There's no MPI kind of parallel communication involved. From here, you can go, you can split these two directly into these three without doing any communication. On the other hand, from here to here, you have to do communication. So you've chosen to design it so that there is com there's no communication on one side, but there is communication on the other side. The consequence of this is that the exchange grid now is not uniformly load balanced. You can see there's four cells of the exchange grid on this processor, but there's only two here. So the work on the exchange grid is unevenly distributed. You'll get a load what's called a load imbalance. So usually the one with only two cells will finish its work first and then it has to sit and wait for that one to get done. 
But we found the experimentation. If you try to load balances exactly, then you have to communicate from both sides. So that turns out to be more expensive than doing this. So we decided to keep it this way. We inherit the parallelism from one side. And then there's a lot of quantities, a whole bunch of quantities, radiative quantities, mass and momentum quantities. These are all transfers from one group to another. So the features are each cell on the exchange bit belongs to exactly one cell on in each direction. Communicating towards the atmosphere and towards the surface. We do interpolation conservatively. Uh, we can do there are different orders. So um, this uh, conservative first order is kind of will lead to some little edges and gradients. So you can do second order, which is smooth. But the problem with second order is it can lead to what are called overshoots. So if you have a positive definite and the quantity that has to be positive. If you do a second order, if you interpolate a parabola between two quantities, then you sometimes get a negative overshoot. So we can you have to figure out ways to avoid this. The, most of them are done using local data, but there is a, everything in the exchange that handles this uh, communication in one direction. And if you have a physically identical grid, if two bits happen to be exactly the same, it will do it exactly without without any without any interpolation. And uh, your question uh, about how you compute it, it is actually expensive to compute the overlap of two bits. So usually we compute it once and we store it. We don't we compute it every time. And this just shows uh, how much load imbalance there was. This is about the performance of the exchange given, I think, and then we'll skip this. Now we'll get to this problem I mentioned about the Lancy mask. So this is actually a very tricky problem. It took us a long while to figure out how to do this exactly right. So the land model has been described this way. This is now in 2D. And the land model has described it. It imagines that this is the land sea boundary, the green land and the land sea boundary. So it says these cells are land and these cells are all ocean. The ocean has a different description. It says this is a land cell and these three cells are ocean. And now you overlap these two and you create an exchange grid. If you look at the red cell, you ask the land cell who does the red cell belong to, the land is going to say it belongs to the ocean. If you ask the ocean who it belongs to, it says it belongs to the land. So neither of them want to own the red cell. The blue cell is the opposite. You ask the land cell who does it belong to, the land cell says it's mine, and you ask the ocean and it says it's mine also. So once you get to this problem where the land sea boundary has been discretized just simply on two grids, you have to come up with a convention to decide what to do with these cells. So we have just said that we want to clip land cells, we'll never clip on ocean cells. We just, it's a, it's a, you can decide whatever you want, but this is just a convention. So this is a convention. Using this, we can get an exact dissertation. We struggled a long time getting exact conservation because of these sorts of issues. Yeah, there was some exchange with cells which I missed. So we need to no, no, clip as in clip off, sorry, but a good point. Clip, clip, clip off, that is, uh, how should I describe this? So, uh, this cell, if you say it belongs to the ocean, uh, then the, the cell has to be clipped like this. So the surface area of the cell will be less than this. The surface area of the square. You're never updating the shot. Hmm? You're never updating the shot. Never updating the red cell, yeah. Yeah. So the the you recompute the surface area so it excludes that cell. So we are going to say what did I say? The sum of cells we we always choose to uh, uh, clip the land grid. We will never clip the ocean grid. That means the blue cells will always belong to the ocean because the ocean claims it. Okay. If they both don't want it. Uh, then also, then it belongs to the uh, land, because then the land can have a clip cell, the ocean cannot have a clip cell. So it's just a convention. You just have to make sure that you still have a clip cell. Okay. So that's all about grids and coupling and time stepping and conservation and exchange grids and everything. Any questions on that? I'm going to move on to different topics. Yes. So the exchange grids, is that one in the couple, couple in the whole? Your master software model, mm -hmm. exchange mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And the unified forecast system is going to have that as well. That's what yeah. 
later on season Dawson Hope and Hope Harley Quinn. Yeah, it was like ten point two three years. Pretty complicated. Yeah. Just the software for doing that. There are the software for doing this very, very accurately. So it originated from a uh, uh, software that was built in the 90s called Script, and now ESMS and FMS, all these have built some new version of that. So there is software for computing the overlap of two graphs extremely accurately now for arbitrary polygons. So the Script you just mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. The question was: Does the clipping have any effect on the physics? Yes. On the land cell, the area, the fractional area, would be a little less than you think. So, if you want to compute uh, uh, flux area integrals, you have to make sure that you're using the right area. So, it has an effect because the area of the cell changes by the clipping. Yeah. Real critical always critical in the ocean. Mm -hmm. Regardless, critical ocean is the end. So the decision of that makes the kind of It's just for convenience. We said it must. We found it harder to clip on the ocean side and the land side, but you could choose to do it the other way. It would be fine. You know, so long as you have a convention and you clip only one side and not the other side, it would be fine. Yeah, no comparison. It's easier to flip the land cell for the same reason, for the reason that the land cells don't really communicate with each other. So they're each by itself. So the only thing that really that's affected is the area of the land cell. The fractional area that you have to deal with is less than the total area of the land cell. That's the only consequence. Yeah. So that's no, we, we, we guarantee that every cell will have a parent. We'll, there will never be a cell which is left out after we do the two things. You could, yes, you could choose to alternate it, I suppose. Mm, we never tried it and I don't particularly see a benefit to it. When, so it can always be on the same side, I don't see what the problem is. For the longer the total... He's saying that maybe you would be representing physics very well in that area. Oh, I see. Well, it's maybe because I'm not a land modeler, I find it easy to do it on the land modeler. Okay. Yeah. Just so I understand, yeah. your thing is two-dimensional if we, for example, or some kind of You compute one-sided derivatives with the heat transfer equation, or how do you do the, the second order differentiation? Yeah, that's a good point. So, um, I'll show you the architecture in a slide or two. There is actually because the tridiagonal has an upward and downward path, there is an atmosphere, and the downward step and the depletion is not fully complete yet. Then you solve the land model and then you go back and complete the atmospheric diffusion in a second pass. So the atmosphere is actually divided now into two phases. In the second phase, you're mainly completing the vertical decision calculation. I'll show that in a, in a few slides, and I'll point it out to you when it comes. Okay, now we're going to talk about this uh, thing which I call uh, uh, coarse grain concurrency. So, I showed atmosphere and ocean running concurrently. What if you wanted to make atmosphere, uh, radiation, chemistry, boundary, land, ocean, all ground concurrency? Then you massively increase the amount of parallelism you have in the system. It is possible. There's some difficulties with it. But let's see how we would do it. So, this is just a description of the radiation component. Its uh, main point is that it's very expensive. The radiative transfer is, it's, it's a non physics and people know how to do it, but it's very expensive. So, normally what people do, in many models, I don't want to claim it's universal. They set the time step of radiative calculation is much larger than the physics time step. So just because they cannot afford it. 
So in our model, for example, the radiation is called once every nine to the extent of what's it for you? Every other. Every other. So every two times. So we found out that our model is pretty sensitive to this ratio. So, so actually, it's just not nine, but it's uh, yeah, twenty and three hours. So this is what Robert was asking about. We have a atmosphere down where you solve the dynamics, you solve the radiation, then you transfer the, you haven't finished the vertical division calculation, then you finish it in the atmosphere state. So you have the main coupler and the atmosphere and the ocean are divided on, on using MPI, so it's parallelism, and then inside the atmosphere you have parallelism and you have PET, open MP as well. So if it's colored green, it means it's using open MP, and if it's colored blue, this, this shade of blue is using uh, MPI. Yeah. When you do that down and up, yeah. when you're doing it down, are you assuming that the concentration is zero? When the layer above, so you have to do the component, then you're laying independently? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that the temperature is, uh, is uh, you know, every calculation here, you're, you're still using the previous temperature. The temperature, the updated temperature, the temperature at time n plus 1 calculation is not being completed until you reach this step. You cannot use the intermediate temperatures I'm except in other degrees. Oh, trace species. Okay. Same, same issue. Same issue. So you delay the calculation is not completed until you reach the step. Yeah, yeah. So, so you can think of it as it will be in some intermediate state, which is not a good thing. This is the way it works in there. It's a boundary condition of universal location. It's less boundary condition. Yeah. And if, you know, elsewhere, you know, you have a, a plus boundary condition. That's how you get the plus. Yeah. Um, time curve. Yeah, you get the you get the flux after you complete the land cycle. You get the boundary condition to complete the complete the upward finish the plan diagonal solid. So here you see that dynamics the way it's called. We call the dynamics and then you call the radiation. So these two occur one after the other. And what we did was within the same thing we moved the because it's an extensive calculation. It, you can make it take the same amount of time. As Everything else put together. So you have not changed the coupling, the coupling so that radiation is running concurrently with the physics. But now you see that the radiation does not know about the updated state. So it's still using the time steps from the lag state from the previous state. And these are all different ways we experimented with doing it. So I'm going to skip over some of these details. But this is the final thing we did. So the radiation is now running concurrently with everything else. The advantage of this also is now that the radiation, if it runs on different, you know, different hardware, so if you want to run it on something else, like supposing radiation runs very well on GPUs, we can actually move it off and run it on the GPU. And this is just showing the results from the climate run. It just showed that uh, by adding about uh, 1.6 times the number of processes, we're getting, getting the equivalent speed. So we can uh, get the scaling up to about 1.6 and get the same result. Now I'll move on to talk about nesting. So this is uh, something that, you know, I think you asked about earlier. So this is the cube scale grid now that we use for the atmosphere. Before I showed you our ocean grid with the sky volume. So the cube scale is used because of the same issue. We don't want to have any poles. So this is a projection of the scale onto a cube. It has these vertices where there is a little bit of distortion of the grid, so there are no poles and there are no singularity. So you can have the two cell grid and then you can also do nesting. So this is a three to one nested grid. That means for each grid cell of the global Q cell grid you have a three by three of the nest. So it's three times finer resolution. You can make sometimes we use this where the nest is actually quite big and covers all of North America. A lot of uh all these it's like almost like doing regional climate modeling over North America. Supposing you have two or three stones going on at the same time, one in the test week, one in the other, you can put a nest on each, so you can have multiple nests. You can have what are called telescoping nests. You put in a nest and then you want to go even finer scale. You can put another nest inside this nest. Why three? Why three? Yeah. Why three? Oh, you can put any number. Recursive. You can put as many as you want. There's no stability issue. 
consideration in terms of what the one is. Uh, three to one, I mean, black or two to one as well. Three to one is generally preferred because um, we have a black one at the trigger. The cell center kind of line up. And you could go five to one, or you could go an odd number to one, you could probably get away with it. I think three to one is kind of, I don't think you want to go seven or nine to one all at once. You would probably do it in two steps if you wanted that. Right. The one reason is that uh, when you do the averaging, when you do interpolation and then you average back, you should get them. Well, one, one good test of this thing is to be able to get the same answer back. And if you do second order conservative interpolation, reconstructing it over nine points is much harder. Three is kind of, for, for second order terms, it has, uh, where you're trying to fit parabolas to everything. Three points is ideal. Mostly we are using three. The other thing about the cube is the point that John Francois raised earlier, that you can have variable resolution. You can actually change the resolution so that the cube itself has higher resolution. One face of the cube has higher resolution than all other faces. So you can do variable resolution as what we call a stretch grid, and, and you can also put nets inside the stretch grid. You actually do this a lot now. We have a stretch grid over North America, and then we're following storms using a net to solve that. Yes? Okay. Do what to do with the Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is some specialized yeah. software for it. Yeah. So, I mean, here's an example, right? So, uh, if you look here, uh, it's kind of Okay, you can see maybe here the the grid lines don't actually there's a discontinuity in slope. There's not discontinuity in, in the in the grid itself, but there's discontinuity in slope. So there are different ways to optimize this. You can have what are called conformal grids, where slopes are always continuous, or you can have mnemonic grids where the areas are more or less continuous. So that you can have either less distortion in the area, or you can have distortion in the in the slopes, and you have to choose one or the other. So if you actually end up solving a differential equation to actually get the grid. The software for that, if you, uh, so it's not complicated like you have, you don't have to do it yourself from first country. But there is some numerical issues there. Um, it's a good question. We're actually with the one we're going to follow it today. They actually crosses, we made them cross the face, and uh, even harder problems to think about is that they want to cross the face. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty hard. A hard problem. <laughs> yeah. It's a very hard problem. So we're working on it right now. Can we handle the over the ocean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the ocean itself is not nesting. I mean, uh, this, this is only applied to the atmosphere. Right. But it, it takes the Yeah, I don't know how to do that yet. Yeah, yeah. This is a good question. We are dealing with some of the technical issues of this right now. So I think the first application for this right now is following tropical storms. So we're doing Florence right now using a nest. And we're not worrying about conservation. We're worrying about track and intensity. <laughs> yeah. If you're trying a couple of different models, that has really different grid structures, like a huge sphere versus, you know, just a long grid versus something else, can you split them do that? I mean, yeah. you're saying that you normally pick trying to find a huge sphere for your smooth grid, or? Huge sphere for the atmosphere grid, because we don't want an atmosphere to fall. Yeah, yeah. What about the same grid? The extent grid is just the overlap of that and whatever the ocean grid is. So, so the extent grid is a... Is mm -hmm. Extreme grid is you can, you can only compute it after you decide your atmosphere and your ocean and your land, and then you pass it and say, can calculate the exchange grid and there's a software that will do that. So, they, that's, that's always a 
come to this second. You first decide what your atmosphere and worship is. Do you think the sphere? We are we are we are definitely committed to a cube sphere for the for the future. But it's very strange as well. No, the X is the overlap of so it doesn't matter whether it's a cube, we can deal with anything. We can deal with any polygon. So you're changing yeah, I just think because actually the, we do the surface boundary, we do a lot of transfer question computations on that. So we think of it as a SDL or the surface boundary layer component. Okay. And it's on a completely unstructured grid in answer to your question. It is not structured, it's not logically rectangular. It's a 1D, it's a 1D grid of. I think you have yeah, the last uh, half hour or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you going to talk about a coupling? Why not? Coupling? Well, we all want to kind of live in our own world, our own model. <laughs> I guess I'm really interested in the coupling. Well, that's the thing that seems to be like you have to talk to with the model and that exchange. Yeah, so we don't have a separate thing called a coupling model. Each model just, I mean, as I showed a few times ago, it, uh, the models just send stuff to each other. Like here, I mean, this is, this, there is no separate thing called a coupling model. This is the surface boundary layer. Once you go there, then you compute only a flux history atmosphere from here. There is no separate thing called a coupling model. That runs along and calls each, it tells each one of the runs for like over time steps. Yeah, there is, there is, in software, yes, there is a, there is a main program that says call ocean, call atmosphere, and they're running on different processes. Then it says, okay, exchange your data between you. That's what Yeah, that's, that's what the top level program looks like. So, um, I'm not actually going to show you a sequence of calls in the, in the top level model. That's what you're asking. Yeah. It's done, as I said, every model has its own architecture. It's done in many different ways. So if you are using the kind of standard coupling software that you're using now, there are, you can, you can compose any sequence of calls you want in ESMS. You can say, I want to call this, then I want to call that, and these two have to be parallel, and then they have to communicate with that. So there is a way in New York to write down the sequence of calls you want. I'm not going to discuss anything about how to call these things in the software. But you have to change your model, your proposal model, a little bit, because normally they yes. run along, and they're not used to having to, like, give everything back yes. all the time. Yes, so, like, so one of the things people have to do to work with the couple system, you have to write this thing called a cap, which allows it to communicate to the player. And it has to it has to be able to receive from the cap on the instructions that says, run an hour and then come back and give me some data, that sort of thing. And then here's why we use Nest, it's just an example. So this is Lee Watersees, which is, uh, you have uh, easterly flow over Hawaii. And these are the islands of Hawaii. And they give rise to these watersees and there's a lot of, uh, yeah. first of all, it's uh, interesting dynamics, but they also produce a lot of rain on the west coast of Hawaii. So this is a cube sphere. If you run on a C360, which is uh, around, um, 50 kilometer global resolution cubes here, then you've got a very nice set of Lee water seeds. If you reduce the resolution to C120, which is like 150 kilometers, they basically don't exist at all. You don't get any of them. You basically don't even see that Hawaii exists. Hawaii just exists. So let's say you can't afford to run this model globally, but you want to have the Lee water seeds. What you do is you put in this nested area just over Hawaii. And now this is C120 uh, for the global model, and then C360 just over this area. And then again, you manage to create, not only create the Lee water seeds of the mountain, you can make them propagate out into the course grid area. There's slightly less intensity than before, but there, at least you're getting them. So this is why we use NEF, and this is an example of Hawaii, but a lot of what it's used for is to track tropical segments. 
And this is, this is an active area of research because of some of the technical problems that you guys have been raising, like how do you go over a cube edge and a corner and what you do with the Nancy mark as the cube is moving. You're right, when I said that you compute the exchange rate only once, um, but honestly, I'm just thinking about it. Uh, each time the thing moves, we, have to, we would have to recompute it. It would be quite expensive, actually. The other issue with uh, this two-way nesting is that normally uh, it's, it, it can only be done serially. So think about it this way. So there's a three-to-one nesting, and this is the fine model and this is the coarse model. When you change the resolution, the time step also goes down by the same factor. So uh, to go from coarse n to n plus one time step, the time grain is going to execute three time steps. Going to be an n plus one third and n plus two third time step. And for this, it needs value conditions from the coarse step. So you have to somehow come up with this number as what, what is the value of the coarse grain after one third and after two thirds of a time step. Normally it's done in normal couple models by interpolating between C n and C n plus one. In order to do that, what has to happen is that both models stop, C n executes forward, and then you in interpolate these two values, and then you supply the boundary condition of n before a uh, fine model can go, then it has to communicate back. So each time the course model has to wait for the fine, and the fine model has to wait for the course. So this is not uh, sustainable. We want them to run concurrently. So the innovation we did in this paper is that to get these numbers, you use what's called an Adams batch for time step, which instead of interpolating, you take C n minus one and C n and you extrapolate to get these numbers. And with that, we're able to run these two things concurrently because now uh, F n plus one third does not have to wait for C n plus one. So. And then now I'm going to get into some of the issues that when you try to do similar things in the ocean, we run into issues. So, but this much is clear, right? So this is the ocean issue we found. So in the ocean and ice now, we have them running concurrently with each other. The problem is that the sea ice moves very fast because it's, uh, because there are surface waves in the ocean. It's moved very, very fast. 200 meters per second is the typical phase speed of surface waves in the ocean. And you're running uh, the CR concurrently and it's only seeing the previous time step. And it's, the, it's trying to react to something that's changing very fast. It sometimes doesn't do that correctly. And this is an example that there is sudden explosive growth in Arctic sea ice which doesn't actually seem to make sense. It doesn't have an obvious physical cause. So when you found this, we didn't know. This actually causes the model to crash after a good while because it builds up so much ice. So this is a paper about the evidence of the, the lag, meaning that seeing the ocean state from the previous time step is causing an instability. And this is now, if you look at it very closely, where the instability is coming from, just zooming in on the area and then looking at a single point and looking at the time frame, you see these wild oscillations happening. And that is the result of the instability. You could diagnose it as being part of this coupled instability. So what do you do about it? So here's how it's done normally. So going from one time to the next time, you have ocean dynamics, ocean thermodynamics, you know, ice thermodynamics, atmosphere, and ice, ice dynamics. So you need uh, the boundary condition in here in order to execute this component, and then you need this definition in order to execute this component. So this is the way it's done normally. When you're doing it concurrently, what happens is that uh, one trick you can play is to say that the atmosphere and ice thermodynamics executes concurrently with the ocean dynamics. So the dynamics of thermo are switched. So here you do dynamics and then thermo, there you do thermo and then dynamics. If you do that, then you can actually exchange data in a way that you can do it concurrently in a stable way. But even this or shown to lead to instabilities. So, one thing is to take this component and move over here and move it over here. So, this too is the ice model, CF model, as part of the mount system. 
And now we have restructured it so that the ice, the ice dynamic can be placed either here or here. We can, we can do it in one of two places. There are a couple of other more advanced things. If, if, even this, if after this we even now still have instability. So far the evidence is that we probably don't. But if we did, then there are some tricks we can play. One is called staggered concurrent coupling. Where if the ocean is in stage C n plus 1, the rest of these things, the atmosphere and ice, live in a state of C plus half. Just like they're showing you with the nested model. So it's actually staggered by half a time step. If I don't know how the answer, then you can actually see the boundary conditions correctly. And you can do these exchanges, these alternating exchanges of dynamics and thermodynamics in a way that uh, executes stably. Yes? Yeah. It's not that easy. I, I don't know if that's true. Is that true? I think you can. Well, I mean, maybe we'll try to fix. Because, I mean, you know, the capital is for the dynamic system. I know it's structured like that, but I think internally, size can be broken up like this. The dynamic and thermodynamics can, can be separated. But then you're right. You have to write separate caps and write the sequence to follow something like right. this. Yeah, you don't have to do that. But yes, you're right, because here we internally we move this through without that much. Yeah. Yep. In that situation, 28, yeah. don't you still have to have the ice dynamics or something like that? Doesn't one have to go first and then something second? Isn't it like, isn't it like if they were in the same model, you still do operator splitting, we still Yes, you're still, you're, still you're right. So I, I, I glossed over a particular detail here. So okay. we are doing operator splitting. Yeah. So the, the, there's, there's two time steps inside both of these. There's time splitting going on. So the, in the ocean, the surface waves, because there are two orders of magnitude faster phase streams than the internal waves, you do operator splitting and solve those, uh, we run it basically 100 time steps per time step roughly. So that's called the barotropic time step. This coupling happens on the barotropic time step, not on the barotropic time step. So you're absolutely you put your finger on a set to detail and most of it. And then the other thing that I don't know that's what I mentioned, so it's, it's, it's another way to make the system stable is to use this method of using the previous two time steps in order to get your state. So but then these are all things which are actually speculative at this point. So you can do concurrent coupling plus item slash work. And then the most advanced thing would be staggered temperance coupling plus item slash work. So basically turn on all your switches. <laughs> yeah. But this is the ultimate guarantor of stability. But we haven't done any of this yet. This is just hypothetical at this point. And then, um, few more details, we are also trying to run uh, chemistry concurrently with the rest of the, with the radiation. There's, there's many things which we believe we can go with this concurrent coupling approach. I think we can do it with chemistry, we can do it with ocean biology chemistry. What we cannot do is with this moisture, this cloud and so forth, because the coupling is so tight between the thermodynamics to separate it out and call and then make the cloud see the lag temperature field, I think that will never work. So accepting for that, we are trying to move everything we can into this country. And then this is just to say that, you know, we keep adding new features to the coupler. One of them is that now there is this new uh, program to, uh, from, uh, Paul Gino is a scientist specializing in, in dust. And you want the dust, the, the wind actually takes dust off the desert surface and, and then it becomes, it, 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 it gets ejected over a place where it can uh, become, it serves as aerosol. It can both serve as, it, it is both radiatively active and serves as a nuclear source. So there's both dry and wet deposition, so it also serves for making clouds. 
And in order to make this happen, we have to do a fairly complicated amount of work inside this area that I've been on the exchange with basically. We have to do some very complicated things where it has to go in the land cell underneath. So we have top land, past, what fraction is top land, what fraction is pasture, and that sort of thing, what fraction is secondary ridge. So it needs to know about the vegetation types. So we have to expose more of stuff that was so called internal to the land model have to be exposed to the exchange grid in order to make this best problem happen. So the idea is to just show that, uh, you know, we keep adding features like this and the exchange grid continues to evolve. And the final thing I mentioned is that we are implementing the grid and the grid coming through. Okay. In that case, when you're having dry product position, mm -hmm. surface exchange, usually I'm thinking of two layers closest to that interface. But in the mm -hmm. case of what the position could be coming from much higher up. <laughs> yeah. You're ready to get to the case from the left much higher up. Mm -hmm. Are you sure that this doesn't seem to be Unless you somehow hardwired it in to say we're going to let stuff come down. Well, the rain differently over different parts of the planet. And that kind of thing. Well, no, I think you can't even follow that plan. No, it depends on a particular rate. I don't think we change that. I think it still has to come to the last good cell before we allow the top line to happen. Um, the rain could come from much higher. Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The rain could come from much higher, but it would still. Uh, we, we follow the the like the terminal fall speed of rain. Oh, you're letting it fall. Yeah, oh, okay. you're letting it fall. Okay. It's going to fall over the entire grid. Yeah. Okay. It's going to fall over the entire grid, but uh, the coupling can depend on the fraction of the grid cells, the fraction of the land grid cells that has. Uh, desert in this program that has, that the country can be a dust source. Everything cannot be a dust source. Every, every, all factors of this may not be a dust source. I believe that is the, I'm not a complete expert on this, but I think that is the wet and dry distinction. There is also over the, it's also happening over the ocean. There is also, this something is also happening over the ocean. This this is uh, I may not be capturing all the details because this is one of the most couple most complicated coupling features we built in the last couple of years. The last couple of years. And I'm going to wind up soon, so this is just to show we we might want to think about even though we're moving to coupling on the order of four or five or maybe maximum of ten processes. We might need to go much further than this. So there is a kind of parallelism which is being promoted called DAG, which is transfer directed acyclic graph. So this is a graph, acyclic means there's no loops. So there's a sequence of stars and then there's another sequence of stars in the that they're color coded. Usually what happens is that if this is a sub between this is a sub between this is think of each one of the different physics between. You execute one, then you execute the next one, then you execute the third one. And what happens is that if this one, some process will get done first, and then so all the white space is idle time. So in, in the DAG approach, you connect up the entire thing into one big graph. So anytime any task is done, uh, this blue, this process finishes blue, so it can start executing some yellow at the same time. So, but this involves really fine scale restructuring of the code. But these are all uh, things that uh, you, if, if you're going to be coupling different components together, you have to start thinking of what can we do things of this nature. One reason why we might want to is that the hardware being built which actually is meant for dealing with graphs really well. So this is just an example from a different paper which shows that instead of having this graph that executes in zero to seven, eight time steps, you can you can make it you can densely track it so it executes as four. So it can be in, instead of becoming uh, n squared it goes in n log n time steps. So there are ways of feeding up graphs if you have the right kind of architecture. So these are some of the future directions. What I think will happen is that we will try to aim for more and more concurrency 
across physics, across space and time, of course. I'm going to kind of end here, leave some time for questions. So there's a little recap. So I just want to go over all the terminology of race, and if you have any questions, coupling, nesting, chaining, anybody have any questions about this stuff? All clear? So, yeah. So, one of the things that we're talking about is the We've been talking about it, but they've not done anything about it. I agree with you, that's something that's worth, you, worth thinking about. Uh, one thing, as we will have, if you Mm -hmm. right. If you can see, and uh, the other thing we I think uh, you're probably thinking about the same thing. It, it will work, I think, if the other uh, trade, which is a form of, you can think of it as a form of nesting actually. We don't want to do interpolations. We want one to be an exact, one grid to be an exact subset of the other. Yes or no? We're, we're looking at it. Okay, totally different. Yeah. Different definition. But isn't the thing that you guys tie together in the sense that you design it and it comes to the dynamics, it kind of doesn't, you know, that you cut it off twice? Yeah. And I'm not sure fully understand or agree that it makes sense. But it's something that I know people are explored, but which is why it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't talk about that. I didn't think of talking about it. We're not actually done anyway. Talking about it. I think uh, MPI in Hamburg is actually trying it in the icon model. Okay, then chain models have become couple. So is that there's a fun time you start by having a model that's a downstream model, then eventually you say, well, there's a feedback I want to think about, so then you bring them. Sometimes people get do very far fetched things in my opinion, coupling, but that's their business, not mine. And then the third thing I talked about a lot is we worry about the, a lot of this is based on computing extremely small differences between large quantities. The, the, I talked about for radiation and CO2 and so forth. Biggest example is uh, sea level rise. Because you have an ocean that's you know, thousands of meters deep, and then you have tides on it which are what three orders of magnitude smaller, one to ten meters per day. And you're trying to compute sea level rise, which is one meter per century, roughly. So if there's a, I believe there's order of a million hours in a century. So it's a micron per hour. If you have an hour time step, it's a micron per time step. And you want to compute something to micron accuracy in a, in a fluid that's a thousand meters deep. So that's that's the kind of thing. That's why I just we worry all the time about uh, accuracy. And the people ask us, can you do all this with single position? And I think sure people seem to be happy, and the ocean people are not happy at all. Yeah. When you cut this stuff up, you have to do the position, I think. Yeah. 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 And then implicit versus explicit. Not clear? Yes, no. Okay. Exchange grid. Somebody had a question. I'm sorry, you missed the button. <laughs> mask is a very tricky issue. Because of the discretization. If you have two different grids and discretize the land you mask differently, you have a lot of problems. So there's a lot of that aspect. Yeah. What about a long time scale? Sea level rise would expose more than you. Yeah. Right now, it's expensive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, what they call the ocean community, they call it wetting and drying. That's the uh, problem we haven't actually addressed yet. But with the ice sheet coupling, we have to start thinking about it. It makes all this because the exchange rate computation is expensive. And if you have to do it repeatedly, that's an issue that becomes kind of good. Then I actually, one example I gave of how we use couplers in data simulation because you're running ensemble columnar filters and you couple the entire ensemble 
into one application using the same coupler. And then cost and concurrency was all of my examples in the last uh, part of my talk. And then here's a bunch of links to the end. All the blue stuff is links if you get access to the slides you can check on them. That's right. And also the way the current hardware is changing, the arithmetic has stopped getting any faster. So the actual speed of a multiplier and add is never going to get any faster. You solve. So the only way you're going to get faster is by becoming more faster. The one thing that I would ask you your question is really good was uh, conservation. For us, when building TV, that is something that we spend a lot of time. Yeah. That, that's where some of the details uh, are really critical yeah. the conservation of water through mm -hmm. the interface back and forth. And it's, it's, it's where you start doing. Essentially, long run, and it's for at least decades. Then you start seeing trends and collision even more. So we have to find a tiny little thing. Yeah. Some of them, and you can do this with you on the building. Very hard to find. So I can give you one one example of a long term. So the exchange that actually made us actually think about this very carefully. But we found one problem uh, which is related exactly to this. And it was found by somebody who said, I found a discrepancy in, in water conservation, which is leading to a 1.4 millimeters per century of sea level rise, which I think is not critical, but that's particularly 1.4. Couldn't they explain it by adding up all the components that are supposed to contribute to sea level rise. And it turned out to be from the fact that even though the ocean and the atmosphere were using the same radius of the air, uh, one was following a, a, a one was treating a triangle as a plane, and the one was following the curvature of the Earth. So they, there was a systematic difference. It's like one was computing area like this, and the other was computing area like that. So it turned it was not a random difference. It was a systematic difference between the two in the way they compute the area. And the way we found out is that we went and looked on the exchange, and we found the number and our number didn't match. Yeah. yeah. Conservation is is thing that we spend. I think I, I agree with you. That's why we spend a lot of time worrying about. Can you treat all of this stuff? So this, this is a, uh, this is a book. We talked about coupling software and strategies. We talked about many different ways of implementing it. You, I think you should be aware of it, um, but I obviously don't expect everybody to go into all the technical details of how. Yes, because I think things like instabilities and non-conservation and all that, if you find them, you should have a way of Asking at least the right question and going, knowing whom to ask, like I'm finding non-conservation, where do you think it comes from? I think you need to be able to ask that question. And we spend a lot of time trying to make this as good as we can, but there's, I'm sure there's still a lot to be done. Uh, I put it up on a, on a drive somewhere, and I'm pretty sure. I I feel so it's uh, it there's no license on it. You can just read it. And all these things are linked you can click on. Blue the blue blue text is linked. You still have ten minutes? So can you recommend a cup of cup water for just starting out on this? And most of these things are open source, but I think if you're working in the NOAA community, there is a couple of that everybody is building around. You should use that. No, it's not FMS. Okay. FMS is what you use with JPL. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
but it, it was seen that they made it for some of the observers to be built. Now, as far as you can see, you can see my model. So something called CMAPS, which is trying to bring the theme and the language yeah. and everything together. Yeah. And then we share the last, I think, we we'll go through all of them, but there is this, uh, every two years, roughly, this is between this is the fourth, you had a fourth workshop on coupling technologies has about 50 attendees from around the world, which we announced in the last one, it's 2017, so should be one next year, I don't remember where it Okay, there's no further questions, thank you all, thank you all for staying. <laughs>